Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? I can yell really loud, but I'd like to try to save my voice. But uh, we're going to use the pulpit mic this morning. So um, if you can't hear me, can't hear me in the back, just give me a little, you know, symbol or something. Um, and I'll try to speak louder. A few announcements uh, this morning before we begin our worship. Of course, we have normal um, weekday activities. Um, and then on Thursday, you'll see that True Presbyters will meet at Natalie Lavender's at 1130. And that's this coming Thursday. Also, um, choir practice will be immediately following the service in here. If you um, have not joined, there is still time. You can still come today to, um, to come be a part of the choir. So please, uh, please consider that. We, uh, we certainly need your voices for Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, also, if you'll look at those future dates down below, um, April 4th and June 6th both have important events. June 6th begins Vacation Bible School at First Baptist Church. Also, uh, this is not on there, um, but Holy Week services uh, will be held at the Methodist Church this year. It's their turn to host, and so um, I'll give you more information um, as the time draws near, um, but those are always great weekly services. Um, anything else, Pastor? Any other announcements? All right. Please stand with me for your call to worship. Your call this morning comes from Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's sing now to the Lord, singing hymn number 293, Rise Up, O Church of God, 293. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have gathered this Lord's Day morning to meet, commune, and bless, your, bless you. We ask, O oh Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you would dwell with us, that you would strengthen us, that you would sanctify us, that you would change our hearts to more and more be like the heart of the Son, the Lord Jesus, who loved his Father with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, who was in this earthly life, in his incarnation, was obedient. Obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Lord, we want to be more like the Lord Jesus. We want to obey you more. We want to love you more. We want to know you more. 
And so for that, we ask that on this Lord's Day, you would work through the means of grace to bring about just that. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer the Lord Jesus taught us, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we are going to recite um, part one of the Athanasian Creed. The Athanasian Creed is another historic creed that has been recited together in churches um, since the early days. And it's a very rich um, doctrinal creed and it's a wonderful thing to recite together. It is long. This is just part one. Um, there's going to be three or four parts. And so uh, we're going to recite this for the next couple of weeks before we return back to the Apostles' Creed, uh, but I do like to, to implement um, some new ones occasionally. So I ask you this morning, Christian, what is it that you believe? Whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither confounding their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal, and yet there are not three eternal beings, but there is one being. So they're, they're uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings. There is but one almighty being. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods. There is but one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords. There is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. You may be seated. I think the idea that you get there is that there's one God and three persons. And those three persons are one in essence, one in being, but distinct in personhood, and yet um, they are co-equal and co-eternal. And that God, that magnificent God, the mystery of the Trinity, this triune being who is one, 
is so great and so grand and so glorious that sin cannot enter into his presence or he'll crush it. He cannot stand it. And yet, out of great love for us and the glory of his name, one of those persons left his eternal abode, took on human flesh, and lived among us obediently and then was crucified, dead, and buried and raised again on the third day for our justification so that you and I, mere creatures, can enter into the presence of this thrice holy God. And so I encourage you to pray with me this corporate prayer of confession so that we can hear the forgiveness offered to us. Almighty and most merciful God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against Thee in thought, word, and deed, that we have not loved Thee with all our heart and soul, with all our mind and strength, and that we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We beseech Thee, O God, to forgive what we have been, to help us to amend what we are, and of Thy mercy to direct what we shall be so that we may henceforth walk in the way of thy commandments and do those things which are pleasing in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take a moment to silently confess to the Lord your own sins. People of God, lift your eyes and hear the words of assurance for you this morning from Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Friends, that great truth that the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus is sufficient for us is a great reason to rejoice, and it's a great reason to give out of love and appreciation. So I invite you to give and give joyfully.
Lord, you have given so much to us. We ask, Lord, that you would take now what we have given to you that was truly and rightfully already yours, but we do this as an act of worship, an act of consecration for those things that you've given us, and we ask that you would bless them, use them, multiply them, all to the glory and fame of your name and the building of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing hymn number 468. The King of Love, my Shepherd is. 468. may be seated. Before we pray, I want to um, to say, uh, just give you a brief report. A, a more full report will come um, on Wednesday, um, and perhaps maybe we could even do a, a full, more full report tonight. Um, but uh, I wanted to, to just briefly tell you that there was a, several of us who went to the Jumpstart graduation at Brent Presbyterian last night, and then I was fortunate to be a part of the graduation ceremony on, at Bibb County Correctional Facility on the inside. So I got to experience both the inside and the outside graduations. And uh, let me just say that the love that our church and support that our church shows these men um, does far more than you could ever imagine. Um, they are so appreciative and so humble and um, filled with joy and godliness. And uh, it really is a, a remarkable thing to see. So I encourage, you know, especially, I encourage all of you to, to attend a graduation at Brent, um, but especially you men, um, who are interested in going inside Bibb County Correctional, um, you know, please let me know. It, it is very uh, quick paperwork to get in there. It takes about five minutes. And uh, what I experienced both inside and outside really is just um, beyond, beyond words. It was remarkable. You know, when you watch on the inside, when you watch a man who's getting a life, he has a life term because he's of multiple murders and who's been on MSNBC because he's so 
was so crazy, uh, receive a degree from Birmingham Theological Seminary and with tears in his eyes, with joy, talk, you know, speaking about how he wants to continue to mentor and teach um, the Bible and the Reformed faith to the new guys coming in. That's remarkable. That's remarkable. Um, and so on the outside, you know, we all know Billy and Chris, and they graduated uh, yesterday. And um, there was, I mean, it was palpable, the, the love that they had for each other and the gratitude they had for the program. Um, you know, friends, the gospel works. It really does. The gospel works. And it seems so crazy and so foolish, um, but, and it is. It's foolish to those who are perishing. But to those of us who have received eternal life, friends, we get it. The gospel really does amazing things with people and shines in the darkest of places. All right, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we uh, give you praise this Sabbath morning for your many blessings and especially the ones that I just mentioned and the work that you've done in the lives of so many so many men that the world had given up on, so many men that the community and their families even had given up on because they were too far. Sin was too hard of a master, and yet you and your kindness and grace freed them. You cleaned them up and washed them in the blood of Christ and made them new creatures, just as your word says that you will do. And so, Lord, as we are able to see that with our eyes, we ask, Lord, that we would even be able to see it in a greater light with our spiritual eyes, that our faith would build as a result of hearing and seeing the testimony of these men and seeing that they are truly trophies of grace, that you have won for yourself. Lord, we pray uh, for your church this morning, not just our church, but other churches such as Carrollton Baptist Church. They've been like they were hit hard with COVID and have not quite recovered to the fullness that they once had. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless my brother pastor over there and that you would bless that congregation, that newness and revival would come, that your people would be stirred up for worship once again and that they would experience great and glorious and fruitful days. And we ask, Lord, that there would be a, a light shining in Carrollton, a city on a hill for those people. Lord, we pray uh, for those in our congregation who are sick. We meet every week, Lord, to, to offer our prayers and praises to you, and we ask that um, you would hear us, that you would bless us by answering those prayers. Your will is greater than ours. Your ways are higher than ours. Your plan is better than ours. But we do pray, um, Lord, for those who are struggling with cancer or illnesses or anxieties or whatever the need is, Lord. Those who are mourning death of a loved one, those who are in the military and college students. Lord, there's so many that we have to pray for, and yet it can be overwhelming to us, but it's not overwhelming to you. And so we ask, Lord, that you would meet the needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus for those on that list. And we ask, Lord, this morning, uh, as we come to your word, it's, we come to it because it's the bread of life because it's words of life for us, because it's, Lord, where true hope and renewal can be found, because it is where you meet with us. And so we pray, Lord, as beggars coming to find bread, that you would give us that bread in your word this morning. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm number 92. Psalm number 92.
I have enjoyed thus far um, preaching the Psalms. Several of you have commented that you've enjoyed going through various Psalms, and this is one of my personal favorites, but it's also a newer favorite for me. Um, it's a newer favorite. Uh, it's, I had read it, um, of course, several times. Um, but uh, there is something about, um, you know, when you hear someone else preach it, it gives it life, it gives it flesh. And uh, so I'd heard a, a great preacher um, who's in North Carolina to preach this psalm, and it uh, was, I heard it, you know, maybe last year or something, and it really just inflamed my heart. And so my goal this morning um, is that uh, this text would perhaps become a favorite for yours, that it would become something like a, um, a road map or a guidepost for your life, and that it would enrich your soul. Psalm number 92. Hear God's word. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night with the ten-string lute and with harp, with resounding music upon the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this that when the wicked sprouted up like grass and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is un no unrighteousness in him. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Well, this is the only psalm in the Psalter that is directly appointed for the Lord's Day or Sabbath Day worship. It's the only one that really has that title. There are other psalms that are, uh, in fact, all the psalms are appropriate to be sung in Lord's Day worship. And there are some that are dedicated to certain days of the week, and there are some that we know for sure were sung on the Sabbath. But this one is unique in particular. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, we will break up this text into three sections. Again, just like uh, previous psalms, your Bible may uh, outline those three sections for you. And so you can be looking ahead or, or following along. Let me give you the three sections. First, it's verses 1 through 4. We will look at worship. Worship. In verses 5 through 9, we will look at warning. Warning, and then 10 through 15, we'll look at the reward. The reward. And this, really, these three headings are answering the question of what is the Lord's Day for? What happens on the Lord's Day? And they are worship, warning, and reward. Well, let's look at the first four verses together. The psalmist, most likely David, says, it is good to give thanks to Yahweh, to the Lord, and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, or O Majestic One, Exalted One. 
David is clear here, and as the Psalms elsewhere are clear, and the New Testament is clear, that on the Lord's Day, and also in your private worship, but especially on the Lord's Day, we are to sing and proclaim the greatness of God with our voices and with our gifts. It is good to do that. That's one of the ways that we give Him thanks. In fact, the, the whole earth really sings the praises of God. The mountains cry out in worship of Him. The babbling brook that makes its noise is so... Well, it makes a noise because that's exactly what God has intended it to do. You know, He could have made it to where the water doesn't make any noise in a brook or in a river or in an ocean. And if you're anything like me, and I'm not, uh, you know, I, you know I, I like the ocean as far as I like to sit, you know, on the beach and relax. I don't, I'm not a swimmer. I can swim. I don't enjoy it, though. Um, I'm more like a beached whale out there. Um, you know, I get out too far, and the kids think there's an island they can swim to, and I, I just, don't, just don't do it. But I do love, especially at night, there's something about being on the beach at night where you hear the ocean, you hear the waves, you hear it crashing, and it, it really is music to your ears. Or being in the mountains. I love to go, you know, I'm from the Chattanooga area, so I love to go into the mountains and to hear the birds and the wind and the leaves falling, and, and it's something unique. It happens here, obviously, those same noises, but there's something about being in the mountains where it's almost secluded in a certain way, and the sounds just bounce off the rock, and it's beautiful, and it really is music to your ears, and that is the sound, dear ones, of the whole earth praising God with song. The whole earth lifting its voice to praise its Creator. But David says it's good for us to lift our voices and to sing to the Lord. It's actually a command that we would sing to the Lord. That's one of the ways that He is worshipped and pleased. That's one of the ways that He is explicit about what is to take place in our life. We are made for worship, and one of the ways that we worship is by lifting our collective voices to sing to God. Music has a, an effect on us. It has a special effect. There's something about hearing a grand orchestra come together, a symphony of, of all these seemingly um, incompatible instruments, and yet they come together to make a, a beautiful noise, a beautiful sound. My friends, that's exactly what the congregation of saints really is. It's a bunch of people who are, for the most part, incompatible in a lot of ways. Even our own voices, most of the time, are incompatible. And yet, we are to come together collectively as one voice to sing the praises of God. We should, we should so be enthralled with thankfulness and enthralled with the glory of God that we sing collectively together so loud that the very roof begins to shake. We should sing so loud that even angels have to stop what they're doing to listen. We should sing so loud that Charlie has a hard time preaching. I want to give him a hard time anyways, right? But we should sing so loud that they hear us. And they should sing so loud that we hear them. And we may be singing different songs. Ours are better, for sure. But we should be, even in that, we should be, it's a collective voice of praise to the God who loves us and created us and cares for us. And David tells us that. Why is it good to sing to his name? Verse 2, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. That word loving kindness, you see it pushed together in conjunction. And, and it's a Hebrew word that we really don't have a great definition for. You've probably heard the Hebrew word before in passing or in a sermon or something, but the Hebrew word is hesed. And it's a covenantal faithful love. It's actually God's stubborn commitment to bless us no matter what. 
When you see that word loving kindness, it is God's stubborn, unending, unwavering, unbeatable commitment to bless you, to spite you. That's what that word means. God is so radically committed to your benefit and your good that he will hold nothing back in blessing you, including his very own son. He is so radically committed to his goodness and faithfulness to you that he killed his only son just to bless you and to keep that promise. And David says that is a reason for singing. And if that doesn't cause you to want to sing a little bit louder, well, and your wood ain't wet. You're dead. And if you're not dead, you're in a, a state of concern if your heart doesn't get inflamed by that truth. And listen, I'll be very honest here. Men are the worst about not wanting to sing loud. I know. I am one. I get it. Unless you're a man who has a very beautiful voice. Otherwise, you know, the rest of us sometimes can get caught just mouthing the words. Doing something just a hair more than a mumble. Let me be very frank with you. That is disobedience. It is disobedience. God is not concerned about the quality of your voice. Singing is not just for the choir. It's for all the saints. It is for the entire congregation. We must all sing because of the steadfast love of our God. St. Augustine actually reported that when he entered into Milan, he heard people singing. And he said when he heard the people singing, he wept for joy. He wept for joy in the church to hear that pleasing melody. St. Augustine walks into Milan, walks into the congregation, and hears the people singing, and it melts him. Because music has that effect. It's been a gift given to us by God. But look also, it's not just with our voices, but he says, with ten string lute and with harp, with resounding music upon the lyre. Why do we worship God, or how do we worship God? We do it even with our musical gifts. There are more than two people in here who has a musical gift, who can play an instrument. And perhaps you want to lend that gift to the praise of our God to help assist our congregation in worship, and I would encourage you to do so. God has given common grace that instruments were made and, and crafted, and they sound so beautiful so that they can come together and be another sound praising the Lord who made them. But we don't only do this. We don't only sing and have music just for to declare God's hesed to us, His loving kindness and His faithfulness. But we also, verse 4, sing to the Lord and worship the Lord this way. Why? Because of uh, He has made us glad by what He has done. At the works of His hands. What He has created, what He has done. You walk upon a beautiful setting or see a beautiful painting or see a beautiful, uh, unique sculpture or you see, you see your spouse, you see your best friend, you see whatever it is that you find beautiful. And you realize that there's a God who's supremely beautiful who made that, who thought of that, who created that. The divine artist. And we can't help but overflow with joy and say, if you made that, what are you like? God, you have given us so much. One of the things that Ashton and I love, you know, when we go out of town and we're coming back into town, um, here's how we know we're home when we're coming back into Aliceville. It's not the sign. It's not exit 40. That's still 20 minutes away, right? Do you know what it is when we, when we start to really feel at home? 
when we got when we can breathe a little bit is when we pass the cotton fields. To me, that's just one of the most beautiful things in the world. When the cotton fields are just full, and they haven't been haven't been picked yet, and you are driving down, and you just see rows and rows of white cotton. I don't know what it is, but it's so beautiful to us, and we just think, ah, oh, we are back home. And the Lord has made that, and we ought to praise the Lord for that. So we come to the Lord's day to worship, to give adoration to, to bless the Lord for what He has done. Well, not only that, but we come to the Lord's Day for warning. Warning. Sorry, I'm from Georgia. Warning. W-A-R-N-I-N-G. Look at verse 5. He says, How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. It sounds somewhat like the Apostle Paul in Romans. It sounds like Job. The deep things of God. The incomparable, unsearchable wisdom of God. He says, Your thoughts are very deep, but a senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this. The word actually is, is something akin to brutish, almost like comparing those who do not know the Lord as beasts. Like Nebuchadnezzar who went crazy and was driven out and was like an animal. And David says, we will come and worship God and it is foolish to everyone who doesn't know the Lord. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Have you ever stopped to think about how, what do we do in here? We come in here we worship a man who was crucified that we cannot see with our physical eyes. We worship a God who's invisible, who's spirit. And we come in here and we pray. We recite things together. And we sing songs. And then you listen to me babble on for a little while about it from a book that, was, that is ancient that does not get revised. We may sing some more. We eat some very good bread and take the cup. Sometimes we sprinkle water on a baby. And if you're not a Christian, you come in and watch that, you think, that is so silly and so foolish. And David says, yeah, it is. The gospel is foolish to those who are perishing. It's the aroma of death to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the aroma of life. And so he gives a warning. He says, the brutish, the stupid man doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand worship. It doesn't under he doesn't understand what God has done. He doesn't understand why we're so enthralled and engulfed with praise. And in this day and age, verse 7 seems so true. It says that when the wicked sprouted up like glass, like grass, rather, and all who did iniquity flourish. It's like these weeds that are coming up. And they seem to dominate the whole yard sometimes. And you think, I can never get rid of these weeds. They just keep coming. They sprout up even faster than the grass. They flourish, it almost seems. It seems like in the whole world, it's those who are opposed to God that seem like they're so successful in the world that seem like they're benefiting so much, that seem to be in control often. But the weed eater comes, doesn't it? Because they sprouted up and they flourished. And why did they do that? Verse Into verse 7, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. There's a warning when we come to corporate worship. There's a warning... It's the same warning that Peter gives us in his letters. To examine yourself. To know whether or not you're in the faith. To make your calling and election sure. That you not leave here self-deceived about where you stand with Christ. You come and you hear about the coming judgment at the end of the age. The same thing that we heard about last week from Psalm number 2 where the king will come back 
to destroy and judge and damn his enemies. We need that warning. Not only is it for unbelievers, they need to hear it so that they might turn and be saved. But believers need to hear it too. We need to hear it too so that we can examine our own hearts and check ourselves. Or that we can be reminded of what we've been saved from. It's great that you are saved, but do you know what you've been saved from? You've been saved from hell and eternal damnation and the righteous judgment of God. So we are warned that this day is coming. But you, O Lord, are on high forevermore. It, it, seems like the, it seems like they're in charge. It seems like the wicked rule of the day. But God is the one who is on high. God is the one who is on high. Verse 9, For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. Stark, difficult, harsh language about the coming judgment of Yahweh. And yet we are told that this is worth singing about. This was sung in the congregation of the Holy Ones. So we come for warning to be warned of that great day. But also, what's the last thing that we come for? We come for reward. I wanted to keep it a third W, but, you know, and I looked up synonyms and wages just didn't really fit. So we'll keep with reward. Verses 10 through 15, reward. When we come to, to corporate worship, you know, it's, it's, we talk a lot about worshiping God, and that's most certainly true. That's why we're here. We worship God. But you know, worship is not a one-way street in the sense that we do worship God, and He doesn't worship us, of course. But we give praise and honor and glory and our money and our time and all these things to God. But He gives us reward. He gives us benefit. He gives us growth. Notice what he says here. He says in verse 10, But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My, fear, my ears hear of the evildoers who will rise up against me. I hear about all of them doing well. I hear about those who oppose me and oppose the gospel and oppose the church. I hear of the world events. But we already know that they sprout up and they flourish for their judgment. But verse 12, the righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who come and commune with the triune God, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are those who grow. Those who are strengthened. Those who flourish like a palm tree. Those who grow like strong cedars in Lebanon. You know, commentators try to, you know, pick apart. Why do they use palm tree and cedar? Is there anything there? You know, Calvin says, well, you know, cedars often were used uh, for things like scents and, um, you know, aromas and things like that. And that, that may be true. But Calvin, I think, is right because he says it really, it's really not the point. It's really not the point. You get the illustration regardless. Samuel Rutherford, a uh, Scottish divine, wrote in his letters about, about how God, through many trials, makes us like the strong redwoods. Makes us unshakable, un, un, unbeatable even. Because we grow and we flourish and we get strength on the Lord's day. Commenting on this particular verse, Spurgeon says, that, actually it's Matthew Henry says, They shall grow nearer heaven 
and with a holy ambition shall aspire towards the upper world. They shall grow stronger like cedars and fitter for use. The more you come in to worship God, the more you're in the congregation of the saints on the Lord's day, the more God uses the means of grace to strengthen you and grow you and lift you up towards the nearer heaven. Towards the very throne room of God where we are seated according to Colossians. Seated with Christ at the right hand. We in our hearts and in our souls are lifted up and strengthened towards the God who deserves the praise to commune with us. And in the sacraments, the very bread and cup and baptism, and even in the rest of the means of grace, the word and prayer, God by His Spirit comes the Holy Spirit comes to us, grabs us, and lifts our souls. He meets us there. He strengthens us there. He offers us assurance. Gospel assurance. Gospel assurance that says, don't look at your life. Don't look at your works. Look at the works of Christ. Look at the steadfast love, the hesed of God. Look there and be strengthened. Come and worship And these trees are deeply planted. They are deep. They have deep, deep roots. And where are those roots found? In verse 13, they are planted in the house of the Lord. They are planted in the very greenhouse of the Lord where He, as the tender gardener, comes and spends days upon days, minute upon minute, second by second, tending to His garden, tending to His crop, tending to His trees to make sure they are nourished and they grow strong. The divine gardener Himself who comes to tend to us, who at times can be a bruised reed. We're just bent over. And yet the bruised reed He doesn't break. As one minister said in the 1800s, he wrote a book on the bruised reed and he says, he says that it's like this, that you're a bent over bruised reed and at any second you could be crushed and here comes this magisterial army coming down the street and at any moment they could stomp on you and break you completely. And then what happens is the commander, the Lord Jesus Himself, yells out, stop! And He bends over and He lifts up the reed and straightens it out and strengthens it again. That's what happens in corporate worship. We become, we often we come in here, every one of us at one time or another comes in as a, as a bruised reed, as a smoking flax, as a tree that seems stunted in its growth. And Jesus Christ lifts us up, comforts us, and strengthens us. But notice he says also that we are planted in the house of the Lord. We will flourish in the courts of our God. Verse 14, they will still yield fruit in old age. They will be, shall be full of sap and very green. The illustration is not hard to understand. In fact, Perhaps there are those in our minds that we can even envision ourselves. Saints who have, who have almost completed their race. Where the work of Adam has taken its toll, but the work of second Adam, the Lord Jesus. Oh, friends, it's in one way, it's just begun. Those dear saints who have followed God closely their whole lives, their bodies may be giving away, but there's a twinkle in their eye. There's a love for the Gospel. There's a love for the things of Christ. And when that happens, it's just like Proverbs 11.30, which if you were at the graduation, I alluded to yesterday, I spoke about yesterday. Those who grow up and are planted in the house of the Lord, those who have the twinkle of the gospel in their eye despite their decaying bodies, despite their physical conditions, despite cancer, despite dementia, despite all those things, they still have the love and the Holy Spirit abiding in them and they become, Proverbs 11.30, trees of life. Trees of life. That we can't help but get around them 
and feel new again, to feel revived, to be healed ourselves because they are so full of Christ. They are full of sap and very green. You know, I remember when I first got here, and Irvin Eatman took me to visit a handful of families my second day on the job. We saw Jim Parker. We saw Sonny Sterling. We saw Morris Tilly. We saw Kate Atkinson, you had just had surgery. That day was remarkable for me for a number of reasons, but I remember Kate had just had this really invasive, wild surgery. And we walk in and we come to pray with her, and she's in the best mood ever. And I thought, I'd be a miserable wretch complaining about everything, and there she was, just as sweet as ever. Yeah, I remember seeing Jim Parker for the first time. I'd never met him. Heard great things. I got to go in the back room. There he was. The disease had taken its toll, but you know what he did the first time I walked in there? He wanted to compliment me. And I thought, I don't even know you, but you're so full of sap and very green. I could say something positive about every one of them that I've visited. And I thought, leaving every single one of those visits, I want to be more like them because they're more like Jesus to me. Spurgeon says, Nature decays, but grace thrives. Some of you dear older saints in this very room may feel that you're decaying. You may feel your body break down and become weaker, but grace thrives. You are full of sap and very green. We are rewarded. We are given a gift. We are blessed as the Lord makes us just like that. But you understand that the whole world You know, we talked about the gospel being foolish. The world doesn't want you to enter into corporate worship. They may not overtly say that, but it's the work of the devil to keep you out of corporate worship. You know, we used to live in a society, and it was even before my time, but even a little bit when I was a young child. Where certain places were still closed on Sunday. Where the whole town, it seemed to be in church, and no longer is that the case. Now events are just planned on Sundays that draw you out of corporate worship. Most places aren't even considerate of the fact that you, maybe they should do it until after 12 or 12.30 if I go long so that you could at least go to corporate worship. But they, that's not the case. Events are planned. Concerts are planned. Practices hunting trips, it doesn't matter. All good things. All good things that I enjoy. And yet, we are so called to go away from that. And God is saying to us, friends, it doesn't make sense. And sometimes you can't see the immediate result like you can in other things. But the Holy Spirit is working in you. Growing you. And by the end of your age, by the end of your life, you will have more life and more vitality and more health than you could ever imagine if you are planted in the house of the Lord. Don't let the world call you away from your source of life. And then lastly, look what he says in verse 15. To declare that the Lord is upright, He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. You know what benefit we ultimately get? It's the overarching benefit 
that all others come from. You know what it is? It's God Himself. It is God Himself who is our great reward. It is God Himself who meets with us here. He, he could use providence. He could use, as we've been uh, studying, He could use angels to do all sorts of things. He can do a myriad of things. But the primary, things that he, primary thing that He does for us believers as we come to gather for corporate worship is He comes to meet with us. He comes to commune with us. He comes to speak to us. The very God of heaven who sits on the throne reigning even now comes to us and says, there's a lot of means. There's a lot of things I could do in this world. There's a lot of things I am doing in this world. But at this very moment, I am hesitant. I am stubbornly committed to your benefit, to your blessing. We get God. Well, friends, you can see why worship in the church for all ages has been so important. Why it matters so much. Martin Luther famously said, Come, let us sing a psalm and drive the devil away. That's what happens when we sing and worship together. That's what happens when we come and worship the devil flees. Well, let's take the Lord's Supper and sing a hymn, really a psalm, and drive the devil away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your gift of the Sabbath day. Lord, my own heart struggles sometimes. Sometimes I get caught up in it being a work day for me and not a day of worship, and for that I publicly repent and ask, Lord, that you would help me to set the example for the rest of the saints to enjoy the Lord's day, to yearn for it, and to benefit from it. Lord, change our hearts. Grow us, Lord. Make us more and more by the Spirit into the image of Jesus who loved the Lord's day because he loved the Lord of the day. Help us now as we come to the sacrament to be blessed and to benefit and to be strengthened. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't have a microphone, so I have to speak a little bit louder. So I hope that uh, you can hear me okay. In just a moment, we're going to do what we do every month. We're going to eat bread and we're going to drink the cup. And, you know, it's just going to seem like just another day, just another thing we do. But God has said, through Jesus Christ His Son, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And that authority that Jesus has is directly connected to the means of grace where the Holy Spirit comes and meets with us and uses these very means to make us more like Jesus. And you don't see it, but friends, we are trees. We are actually acorns on our way to being an oak. And the Lord's Supper is one of those things, like a good rainfall, healthy soil that causes us to grow. Into acorns or into palm trees or cedars, as Psalm 92 says. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and then we will sup together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the means of grace that you've given us word, prayer, and sacrament. And as we take the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we ask that you would sanctify and use it for your name's sake and for our benefit for our good and your glory. That you would use this to grow us up and make us strong, full of sap and very green. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we are given the words of institution in the Scriptures by the Lord Jesus Himself, but also the Apostle Paul. 
And Jesus says to do this. And to proclaim his death until he comes. That's exactly what we're doing. We're proclaiming the Lord Jesus' death until he returns again. And the instructions that he gave Paul are exactly the words that he gave his disciples. They're the exact words that I minister to you now with. And those words are this. That on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. Blessed, having having given thanks, he said, This is my body, given for you. Take me. In like manner, he took the cup. And he blessed it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And that's exactly what we're going to do. That's what's been promised to us. The very gospel. Picture words. Word picture. The very gospel made real to us in a new way. As the elders come, I'll invite you now to examine yourself whether you be in the Lord. To examine yourself. This table is for for Christians. It's for sinners in need of grace. If you are not a sinner in need of grace, if you don't think you are, if you've not yet closed with Christ, I invite you to not partake. To hold off. Likewise, if you live in the scandal of sin, I invite you to let the tray pass. There will be no judgment from us here, but I do invite you to speak with us. For the rest of us, well, let's take and let's celebrate the gospel. Amen.
cup of the new covenant poured out for you to take and drink. Our Father, we thank you for your great gifts and we ask, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to work in us that which is good and pleasing to your sight, that you would bring to completion that which has become begun in the Lord Jesus. Glory which has begun in our hearts and in our souls. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing our last hymn. Hymn number 584. It is good to sing thy praises. 584. see you all tonight. We've been having a great series. We've had the best attendance on Sunday nights and we've had in a long time. So I encourage you to come and join the fun. All right. Receive your benediction. May the God of grace make you full of sap and very green on this Lord's day. Amen. Go in peace.